uh, again, uh, not an introduction, but just a welcome to uh, Dr. Hermina Nedelescu, uh, our favorite scientist, and a dear friend of ours, <laughs> for the first time giving a talk for IOCS. So we're very thrilled. Hermina, over to you. Okay, thank you. I'm so delighted to be here with, with all of you. Indeed, it is my first time here. And um, well, I'm passionate about a science and theology dialogue. So I'm really happy. Yeah, thank you for welcoming me here. So uh, one of, I still see people coming in. But that's good. So one of the things that keeps me in neuroscience is actually art. The brain's really, really beautiful. And besides the constant discovery that I make, you know, on a regular basis that only me and no one else in the world knows, that keeps me going. The other one is this art. These are some neurons that I drew. They are in the cerebellum. They're called Purkinje cells. And I just want to give you a, a brief description of them because later I will really dive into the brain. They have a soma which or a cell body. And then a dendritic arborization, which receives information from nearby neurons through their axons. And what you don't see are the axons. So that's how the brain is connected. And here is a piece of this dendritic forest, as we call from the cerebellum. Okay. So the title of my talk is Addiction as a Normal Function of the Human Neural System, because I work in the context of drug addiction. Why is it going? I am having some technical issues. So I study all sorts of maladaptive behaviors at Scripps Research. The slides are advancing for me. Do you know why? The slides are advancing on their own. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> so the outline of okay, the outline of my talks is as follows. First, I will start with uh, the basic neurobiology, and then I will work up on the level of complexity. As you know, there's uh, the physical sciences, then chemistry, biology, psychology, cognitive science, um, and and then theology. So on the level of of um, complexity like this. So one of the questions in my talk is, why is the brain's neurocircuitry so set up for addictive behaviors? And I will show you evidence of activated neuronal ensembles, which support such maladaptive behaviors. And then I will move into the psychology realm to show you a general theory to explain both psychological addiction, as well as some people's tendency to expose themselves to great danger. We call this the dark side of drug addiction. We all know that if we are dependent on heroin, this is not good. But today I want to present also the light side of quote unquote addiction, and now be in a theological context. So the hypothesis that I'm working with is that thirsting or craving for God is a, norming, a normal behavioral phenomenon of quote unquote addiction provided by our brain. It's a mechanism that we have really to move us, as St. Maximus the Confessor says, towards the eternal God. And I will show you what I mean by that. This is in honor of the two talks today by uh, Alex and Aiden. I just wanted to show you how a neuroscientist sees the liturgy. So first, the Orthodox liturgy is practiced within an environmental context that is concentrated with sensory information. For example, um, and we perceive this information through the physical senses, such as sight, sound, touch, pain, smell, taste, and the sensation of bodily movements. So, for example, the sugar from the consecrated wine, the Eucharist, falling on the tongue is perceived as sweet, while the sounds from the hymns are deconstructed by the ear into simple and unique vibrations for subsequent analysis by the brain, often providing a sense of splendor in the church. Similarly, visual stimuli, especially in the, uh, through iconography, are integrated. Oh, there we are. <laughs> they come in through the retina. The signal is moved to the thalamus, another brain region, then to the visual cortex. And then there's another connection with the prefrontal cortex. Make sense of all of this that we are seeing. Oh, excuse me. There's a nice quote that I like by St. Paul. Uh, from Corinthians, I will pray with the spirit, but I will pray with the mind. Because earlier, yesterday, Sebastian spoke about the mind. I will sing 
praise with the spirit, but I was saying praise with the mind as well. St. Paul was very much thinking about the brain. So I consider the mind a process of the brain, much like digestion is to the stomach. So without the stomach, we wouldn't really have a complete digestion because digestion starts with the moment you put something in your mouth. There are amylases that, um, that, that get formed to break down the food. So similarly, I think that we cannot have a mind without a brain, not, not complete. So what does a neuroscientist like myself do? Neuroscience is fairly new as a field compared to physics or chemistry. It's a mix of multiple fields. One has to be a no biology. Another, uh, you also have to know molecular biology. You will see the tricks that we use to study the brain. We have to know something about viruses because we use viruses to, um, to study the brain, to see and light up. Um, we deliver fluorescent protein so that we can see the neurons. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to see inside the brain. One has to also be a good neurosurgeon because we have to be able to implant certain probes and deliver these viruses to specific brain regions, as um, Sebastian uh, showed the whole, uh, his, in his talk. We also have to know about optics in order to be able to use the microscope, um, chemistry to be able to measure the neurotransmitters that get released from these uh, neurons. And it's in my case, because I study maladaptive behaviors and various psychological addictions, it's important to know psychological models and something about psychiatry uh, because people are afflicted with these disorders. So to make sense of these human maladaptive behaviors such as obsessions, compulsions, anxieties, eating disorders are just some of the things I've worked on. I use neuroscience. And in modern neuroscience, the, the principle is that all behaviors are a reflection of brain function. The action of the brain underlies not only simple motor behaviors such as walking, breathing, smelling, but also complex uh, affective and cognitive behaviors such as feeling, learning, thinking, making decisions. And finally, the disorders of affect or feelings and cognition, those are of thought, that characterize neurotic, psychotic, or compulsive behaviors despite negative consequences, such as addiction, can be seen as disturbances of brain function. Although I do not, that's what I will show you in this presentation. Okay. So one of the things that fascinated me in the context of the early Christian church beginning to form is how the numerous apostles and martyrs put themselves in extreme danger as they held their intense religious convictions that a crucified criminal was the longest awaited Messiah. So I asked the question, what drove these individuals to such intense cravings to follow Jesus despite negative consequences? Because in our modern times, the intense craving to compulsively seek something one becomes dependent on despite negative consequences is the hallmark of what we define as psychological addiction, such as drug addiction or gambling addiction, sugar addiction, porn, sex, etc. It is a craving despite negative consequences. So how might the theologian reconcile the experience of intense craving for Christ with, say, the craving for another human being? Because there are some human beings that we find great pleasure to be in, in their presence. Or how might we also uh, reconcile with the craving for heroin? All of these, how do we put them together? Is there an overlapping mechanism in the brain? Because there's a limited number of chemicals and neurons and neural circuits that we have. So there's some overlap. The behavioral hypothesis of dependence is one that cannot be easily explained by neuros neuroscience alone or theology on their own, in my opinion. But by integrating them, I think we can get a more comprehensive understanding. So the topic of addiction does not fit well within um, the standard theological models. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Theologians might therefore be excused for ignoring this topic of of addiction, although Sister Vasa has um, spoken about it. Um, they, it might, you might think about it as contained just to brain chemistry and psychological causes primarily concerning behaviorists and neuroscientists like myself. What I'm trying to say is uh, for theologians to come and let's dialogue about addiction. And I, I meant to say, I didn't show you these. That's heroin and the other one is affection with another person. Okay, so um, 
I have a growing suspicion, suspicion that addiction is a more general phenomenon to the human neural system. That's a made up term, by the way, Sebastian. <laughs> I'm talking about the brain system, the nervous system. I don't know what else to call it. It's the neural system with the purpose to perceive and seek the life experiences of what is truly beautiful. We're programmed to seek beautiful things. After all, is there anything more pleasurable than experiencing the magnificence of transcendent love found in divine eternity? So here's, I'm going to talk a little bit about science and then I will shift. I want to give you the uh, international um, definition of addiction. It's defined as a chronically relapsing brain disorder that is characterized by a compulsion to seek the drug or stimulus because it could be any stimulus. Loss of control and limiting, limiting intake to the stimulus or engaging with it and persistence despite negative consequences. And there's a high propensity for relapse it's never really quenched despite negative consequences. So we all know that it's, uh, in, in my case, I work on opioid and, and alcohol addiction. It's a huge problem. Worldwide, there are more than 3.3 million deaths due to alcohol addiction. It's huge. In the US alone, um, in the case of opioids, there are more than 80,000 people dying from opioid overdose, and it's primarily due to fentanyl. And um, the number of alcohol-related deaths in the U.S. is actually far more than 50,000. It's closer to 90,000. So it is a public problem um, across the, the world. We do have some FDA medications. I just uh, approved medications. Um, they help some individuals. They do not help all individuals. And there's another problem. They're... Um, for example, lofexidine hydrochloride is a blood pressure medication, and it, it is util, utilized to give to uh, people uh, just in the short to get over their withdrawal. So these medications are very, um, they're not specific, just to those neurons that become activated by a stimulus that drives your craving behavior. So that's the whole point of my research. What I'm trying to do is make more defined medication. Um, so I, yeah, um, there's another, of course, it's not FDA approved, but many people report because I work with some of, um, people suffering from substance use disorder, they report a complete cure by turning to God, but that's not FDA approved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, we know it's possible while other people do need medication. So I want to uh, tell you a little bit, um, I want to introduce this gentleman named uh, Donald Hebb because he had a theory about how the brain works and in underlying how we take in environmental stimuli and how that triggers or supports motivated behavior, including drug addiction. Um, because this is at the bottom with all those medications that, are, that sort of flood the brain and will um, it will these compounds that I showed you in the previous slide, they will act at any receptor. As long as the, the, the neuron has that receptor, it will you know, flood all those neurons. So if we want to think about more refined medicine, we want to target just those neurons that went haywire and are supporting our maladaptive behavior. Those are the ones we want to target, not all the neurons in the brain. So this is what his theory was, that uh, so it was nearly 75 years ago, Donald Head published his idea regarding a mechanism of neuronal change leading to the formation of something that he calls cell assemblies that would underlie motivated behaviors and ultimately our conscious thoughts. He proposed that repeated stimuli of specific receptors on the neuron, uh, surface of the neurons would enable the formation of an assembly of neurons, much like um, constellation of uh, of, of environmental features or, or stimuli. So for example, area A and B, oh, they're not my, okay, it's not showing, okay. Area A and B, if these two areas are activated, then that means that neuron F would be activated and not neuron G because neuron G is getting activation from this other area. So you see there's a convergence from this area via this neuron, and from this area via this neuron, and that means neuron F would be activated, but not this one. So there's a specificity. Whereas if these two brain regions were activated, that means the signal would go down these two neurons and then neuron G would be activated. 
So like this, you form a sparse code where because you cannot have all your 86 billion neurons activated at the same time and make sense of the myriad of environmental stimuli around us. So this was his theory. But at the time, he didn't have a, a way to test that theory. And I will show you um, that now we do. But first, let me show you a little bit more how this works. So here's how we think the brain works. These are different brain regions. The hippocampus was uh, is known as our GPS center. It is what uh, helps us remember to get to the restaurant. The amygdala is our emotional center when we feel happy or sad. Uh, thalamus, okay, olfactory is um, if you have a if you smell a nice rose, you'll have cells activating there. Cortex is most expanded in humans. That's how we can do our uh, higher cognitive decision making. A nucleus, uh, uh, okay, a nucleus accumbens is important for uh, reward learning, especially in drug addiction, but uh, other kinds of reward like sugar addiction as well. So. The presentation of a rose may activate this pattern of neurons in the brain. And it's not just in the olfactory cortex because it's gotta be, you have to remember where the rose garden was. So you're going to have your, your GPS center, your hippocampus lit up, and you might have some emotional centers light up as well, even though it doesn't process smell. Um, but that's because you might be with someone you love there in that garden, for example. So like this, you have a sparse code in the brain that becomes activated. These are neurons, and they contain this trace of environmental stimuli. So similar, similarly, when you're in the presence of someone you enjoy being, that might elicit the activation of a different group of neurons. When, and this is for the iconographer, when we see an image of Christ in an icon, that will activate a whole different pattern of neurons throughout the brain, not just in the visual system, but everywhere, in motion, everything. It's a whole network connected, connected with each other. For a person with a heroin disorder, seeing a tool with which to inject heroin is enough to, uh, that's a stimulus to activate a whole different set of neurons, and those neurons will support the behavior of seeking that heroin um, drug. And similarly, a um, traumatic event such as an earthquake that will activate different kinds of neurons. So in this way, environmental stimuli are encoded in the brain in the sparse code to represent specific stimuli, which in turn regulate and support distinctive behaviors. They don't make us behave a certain way. They're just there to support. It's a memory trace. And I wanna be careful because I don't wanna say that the neurons make us behave a certain way. They're just there to support our decisions. This is an image of the brain. <laughs> it's the amygdala or emotional center from uh, an animal. They are neurons, that's what we're looking at. And you don't see much, but we can give an injection of a nasty drug called naloxone, which makes the animal very sick. And we see this pattern. If we eat sugar, we'll see another pattern of activation. This is really powerful. And it's thanks to this um, marker called CFOS. It's a marker for recent cellular activity. So if, if I make a noise like that, you'll have a certain activity in your brain in response to that uh, noise, and you'll have FOS being produced in your neurons right now to say something happened, there was that noise. Um, and we, it's an oncogene, it was actually discovered in the cancer field, but we have now access through this marker and molecular genetics to access these neurons and manipulate them and see what they do. <laughs> so I want to show you, for example, some of the ways that I study these neuronal ensembles that I'm showing you, the sparse code in, in the brain. So in this case, is a study where uh, we extracted cannabidiol from cannabis, and we show that it suppresses cocaine seeking with a U-shape and here's what I'm showing. And this also uh, uh, was reproduced in the neuronal activation, but let me draw your attention to what I'm talking about. So we, if you go to Amazon, um, some people believe CBD is good for them. And uh, there's all sorts of doses from like 10 milligrams to, per kilogram to like 300. So we wanted to do a study to inform, you know, um, to inform the people and to learn what is the right dose. And basically, only seven, 
there's a U-shaped form. So only this dose, there's a specific dose. This is called a dose response curve, but at 7.5 milligrams per kilogram is where the animal no longer feels like seeking the drug. So there's this dose response curve. Not all the cannabidiol works at every dose. You need the, the right dose. But what I also want to show you is that in the brain, when we look, at these number of neurons, we see that that's repeated. So you see this U-shaped curve in the behavior with the suppression, we also see less activation. So there's some, this is just a model. So for a, oh gosh, you can't, it's not very good there. If these were neurons here at the lowest dose, you also have lower activation, which parallels the behavior, the suppression of cocaine seeking by cannabidiol is also um, paralleled by less neuronal activity in that brain area. I'm gonna show you a more difficult study now and after lunch it might be difficult uh, <laughs> to listen, but I think it's important for us to dialogue. It's, uh, if we keep dialoguing, you'll catch on. Um, so this is where we saw the, we tested the effects of withdrawal associated learning on behavior and neuronal activity. So what did we do? On the y-axis is responses of a rat pressing a lever to get alcohol. And here you have them, uh, this bar is a group of rats. After they are dependent, we make them dependent on alcohol. For like 16 weeks, we give them lots of alcohol. And here we, they are not dependent. So you can see when they become dependent, they press more the lever because they're, they need the alcohol, they're craving, so they need it. And here's the interesting thing that, um, that we found is, so these are the dependent rats in the black, and then these are the non-dependent rats. So if we make, um, uh, the, they press the lever, and if we make them press the lever, uh, here, this is work harder. We have a special name for it. It's called FR ratio, but I need to explain it to you in, in general terms. So what it is, is we make the rat work harder for the alcohol by making them press the lever 20 times before they get one drop of alcohol. So what this is showing is that they're willing to work much harder. They'll press 20, 50, many more times to get that alcohol compared to the non-dependent. In this case, it's really interesting. They will press despite punishment. So what we did here is we shocked them with different uh, milliamps, 0 0.2, 0 0.25. And you see that compared to the non-dependent, they press. You can hurt them, but they still press because they are dependent. And then the last one, um, or oh, reinstatement. So um, this is related to relapse. You, you give them one little drop of alcohol after a period of of uh, no alcohol at all, and you can see it spikes up again. They they start pressing. So um, <laughs> you cannot see my uh, Rezban, You cannot see my colors very well. I wanted to show this graph is important. Oh well. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is just a graph that I will talk to you about in depth later, but. When you take alcohol above this baseline, you feel pleasure. And as long as the drug is in your system, you are okay. But as when it goes out you know, of your system, you fall in this, into this craving. Especially in a dependent person, the initial um, feeling of pleasure diminishes and you're just, you need alcohol just to act normal. And then when the alcohol is out of your system, you fall into this um, severe craving. And what happens here is that there's a learning that takes place, which is very powerful. And that's what drives all of this um, behavior to search and seek alcohol, even despite shock. All right. So this is, I just talked to you about plasticity of reward. Uh, neurocircuitry here. And this is what we call the dark side of drug addiction is when we fall into this uh, uh, pattern down there. And to get out, pe people as well and animal, we know from animals, they learn that by taking alcohol, removal of the agony makes them feel good. And that's why there's a dark side. That's why it's a vicious cycle because there's a learning that takes place here. 
if we look in, this is so beautiful, Rizman, you can see now, we look for that FOSS, we look for the activation. And if we look in um, the amygdala area, we see that there's more activation in the brain thanks to that marker FOSS. In, in the animals which underwent that uh, learning experience, they learn that alcohol makes them feel good and they can remove that agony. There's, that's associated with more activation. Then we can expand that to other brain regions and we actually see activation in multiple other regions. Oh, you cannot see my slides. So basically my point is here is that there are different networks connected with each other of brain activity in, in this case of um, withdrawal dependent learning. Okay, next I'm going to switch um, to another story about, so this is how neurons are connected with each other in the brain. They um, originate in one brain region. Here I inserted a little dye in the brain and I followed two axons. So remember at the beginning I said a neuron has a cell body, a dendrite and an axon which sends a highway to a different location. These two neurons send an axon and they give a branch here in this brain region and then a branch in the other brain region. The point I wanna make with this slide is that neurons run in parallel. So this provides a really excellent system because to study neuronal ensembles, because the amygdala, this emotional center, can process both negative and positive um, behaviors, rewarding as well as aversive, something that makes you feel good as well as something that makes you feel bad. And we asked the question of how is it possible that this brain region that sends these highway axons to this other brain region, nucleus accumbens, how is it possible that these neurons start in the same location and in the same location, but can be responsible for two diametrically opposing behaviors? And I believe it's through these neuronal ensembles. So, <laughs> This is getting a little science heavy, but what we did here is we treated one group of, of animals with morphine and then another group of animals with naloxone to make the, oh, my slides aren't that good, to make them feel sick. And we studied approach behavior of morphine, which is a rewarding, pleasurable uh, stimulus. And then we studied avoidance behavior with this nasty stimulus, naloxone. I really apologize, you cannot see my slides. This is a brain section. I delivered a virus with a light activating protein and a fluorescent protein on there into the basal lateral amygdala to label these terminals. And then using this uh, genetic animal model, I will show you that basically what we were able to do is we were able to give a memory to these animals in two different groups. And then we were able to, at a later time, just stimulate that cell group of neurons that were that experienced a rewarding or an aversive stimulus at some other time in the past. They just had the experience. And we were able to mimic the behavior of approaching or avoidance. So this is what the neurons look like. And we shine blue light on this area here. And here is the results. So we have to wake up for this one. <laughs> so <laughs> when I stimulate the neurons that have the memory of the reward, what I'm showing in this plot is that the animals switch their preference from their non-preferred compartment to their preferred compartment. So they are seeking more of that reward. And then in this case, when I stimulate the neurons that have the memory trace of uh, the noxious stimulus, then we see that they avoid that area. That's important to know. And we see that in the control situations that behavior is not, um, not mimicked. So what I, I will end with the science and I will put my theologian hat soon, but what those results show is that there are two distinct groups of neurons and we've showed that causally this is how the brain works. Much of these um, basic mechanisms are also in, in us. There are two distinct groups of neurons, the red ones and the green ones, which become activated to either rewarding stimulus or aversive. And that is what supports our approach 
uh, seeking behavior or avoidance behavior. Good. All right. <laughs> uh, Rizvan, how is my time? I don't have my time. Oh, okay. I have time to show you this. Can you handle one more science slide? Yeah. Okay. Let me so we have identified these um, neurons, which become activated. And so what? <laughs> How are we going to fix the person or the animal that's uh, craving the drug? Um, well, they release a certain neurochemical. It's called glutamate. And what happens is that uh, here at the terminal end in this other brain region, there are actually other axons coming in from all over the brain. And when this glutamate gets released, that activates another receptor on, on these terminals coming in. And that causes the release of a bunch of other neurochemicals. And I'm sure you've heard this one, the dopamine, the pleasure, love uh, neurochemical, but there's other ones. There's norepinephrine release, serotonin release, GABA, which is an inhibitory. Sorry. So you have this you have this cocktail of neurochemicals that gets released. And we want to know, is there a special cocktail that gets released in the case of being when we are presented with a, a rewarding stimulus versus when we are being presented with an aversive stimulus? Because if a special neurochemical combination gets released when we take heroin or nicotine, maybe we can make a drug that will you know, uptake those neurochemicals and it can help us with our nicotine addiction, for example. So that's what we did. And I wanna show you um, how we are doing this. Again, I do a surgery to put this special protein inside the brain and express it at the terminals because that protein is light activating. So when I shine blue light, I can activate those cells um, artificially. And then I have a cannula through which I put a microdialysis membrane. And there, that's just a way for me to separate the small molecules and capture uh, those neurotransmitters. And this is what it looks like here. That is how I stimulate them. And then the membrane allows the passage of these little neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, all of these. And this is the final slide. So in the case of the rewarding stimulus, um, we can see that above baseline, there's an increase of glutamate and aspartate. These are just 13 different neurotransmitters. There are many neurotransmitters that get released. In the case, uh, so it's, it's you get glutamate in both cases and, and that's normal. But what's really unique is that there's dopamine, serotonin and histamine. So that's three unique neurochemicals that get released just when we present the, when we stimulate the neurons that have the rewarding memory. So there is a, a difference. That's all I wanna say with this slide, that there is a difference in what gets released depending on whether we are present, the animals presented with a rewarding stimulus or with an aversive stimulus. So I'm going to do a summary of the science. The correlational studies demonstrated that the size of this neuronal ensemble, this sparse code in the PL is a part in the cortex, it parallels the behavioral effects with a U-shaped uh, curve, and that the size of these neuronal ensembles can grow larger with withdrawal-dependent learning experience in various brain regions. Then I showed you that direct stimulation studies um, of these neurons that were presented either with a rewarding or uh, an aversive stimulus, that in its own specific group of animals support approach or avoidance behavior. And finally, the chemical analysis is, uh, there is unique neurochemicals that get released depending on the experience that we are uh, presented with, reward or an aversive stimulus. So now I'm going to put on my theologian hat <laughs> and ask the question, how do humans determine whether something is good or bad? I showed you what happens at the neurobiological level and how we do engineering tricks in the lab to, you know, to study behavior. But how do humans determine whether something is good or bad? So the brain has evolved multiple strategies to do this and solve this problem. One strategy is the psychological concept of emotional or hedonic valence. And what that is, 
Hedonic valence refers to the degree to which something is pleasurable or positive or aversive. That would be negative valence. So this, to describe this phenomenon, I uh, need to give you two fictitious examples. In the first one, Shortly after March 11th, 2020, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 as a global pandemic. A woman at home reads the news about the world shutting down and is immediately terrified. That is the first peak that you're seeing here. It's up. She's immediately terrified. Countries sealed their borders. Sports teams called their game, uh, canceled their games. Schools closed. Employees were asked to go home. Places of worship closed and people started wearing masks and social distancing. The woman is, uh, is still. She paces the floor, but after she, some time, she slowly regains her composure and gets to work. At this point, she is still bothered by the news, but no longer terrified and distracted. That's called the adaptation phase. That's here. Well, in this stage, she calls her friends, some of whom are doctors or scientists, for an evaluation of the situation. She is frightened, still oh. tense, and very disturbed. Her friends uh, in the biomedical field explain yeah. safety measures to avoid getting infected with a novel respiratory virus, which include wearing a mask, avoiding crowds, and, and so on. Oh. That's my, I apologize. Bear with me because I lost my. <laughs> I usually have my notes, not printed pages, as you can tell. Just bear with me a little bit. Okay. So she's now at the steady phase. She now knows what to do. So this is the steady phase right here. Several days later, the woman leaves her apartment wearing a mask, hesitant to go outside, but is no longer terrified. A few weeks later, she enjoys the outdoor air with a euphoric mood permeating her activities as she resumes part of um, her previous duties. That's called uh, the peak of affective reaction. So now we're down here. It's a completely different feeling than the terrified feeling. Several months later, she returns to work, um, to her normal place of worship on Sundays and her emotional behaviors back to normal equilibrium. So that's called the decay of after reaction. Now she's back at baseline. I want to provide another example uh, next. So just to explain this model. Um, two or three gather on a weekly feast and begin the divine liturgy with an intense pleasure as they experience heaven on earth. That's the peak of the primary uh, reaction that you see. After 30 to 40 minutes of constant level of delightful pleasure, the intensity of this pleasure decreases a little. That's the adaptation phase. Normally, this decline would elicit a calculated behavior ca characterized by more focus, uh, in order to increase the intensity of worship and maintain the level of delight. Perhaps that's when the priest comes out and makes the cross and brings the attention of everyone back to, to the liturgy. Unfortunately, at that moment, again, this is a fictitious example, okay? Unfortunately, at that moment, the presiding priest has a heart attack and collapses on the floor. The abandonment, <laughs> the abandoned two or three faithful experience a quick decline of that delay, delightful liturgical atmosphere. They become tense, anxious, or simply freeze and shock. So that's the opposite. I just wanna show you how we can go up and down around the baseline. A couple of minutes go by, the priest is unresponsive. They call the paramedics and he's off to the emergency room. And then that initial shock will be decayed after time um, with, with time. So this is called, both of those examples that I shared with you, um, in the first one, I introduced an aversive novel uh, virus as a noxious stimulus. And then in the second example, a pleasurable experience during the liturgy. And then it's opposite of what can happen. So that's how we go up and down on this hedonic valence scale. This is called the opponent process um, model. And 
the point of it is to correct extreme hedonic phases. We can't be up there and we can't be down there either for very long. The point um, is that th we have a system to minimize this so that we can function and go about our life. Hover around an equilibrium. Let's look closer at the dynamics of this model with the example of imprinting. Imprinting is to make a mark on something or someone, just as a newly hatched duck imprinting a mother duck and thus follows this duck, the duck everywhere. So after a few stimulations, um, yeah, with few stimulations, this is the example here, there's pleasure and cessation of fear, no distress. And when the input of is gone, then the little duckling feels loneliness, that's the opposite. With multiple stimulations, the the little ducklings uh, know, they feel pleasure, there's no cries, that's their normal being. But when the input is gone and they fall into this agony phase, that, this peak is actually much longer uh, and it's harder to get out of, it's much stronger. So this model provides a general theory for both psychological addiction as, um, or dependence on a mother duck. <laughs> I want to um, show you also what happens with with parachutists. So when parachutists make their first jump, they are often terrified as measured by facial expression and autonomic responses. Upon landing, they feel, um, they appear stunned. Oh, sorry. Upon landing, they appear stunned for several minutes before gradually regaining normal compos composure. However, something interesting happens after parachutists become experts with jumping experience. The response is very different. When, jump when they jump, they no longer feel terrified. That's because it's like normal for them now. They don't get that peak euphoria anymore. Um, they feel tense or even eager. Uh, to jump. After they land safely, they feel exhilarated for hours ex and experience um, parachutists like to jump because of this exuberant feeling after they jump. So they put themselves through repeated aversive stimulation in order to experience the pleasurable peak afterwards. They know what's about to come. So um, this um, from this point of view, this type of a paramasochistic behavior where pleasure is gained from pain is not a mental disorder, but rather a reflection of a normal functioning of a healthy, autonomic, emotional control system that we have. Thus, from this point of view, there's nothing abnormal or strange about addiction either. I often think about how the martyrs also put themselves in extreme danger as they held their intense religious convictions that a crucified criminal was the long-awaited Messiah. They were totally dependent on their Christ as Lord and God. Could anticipating such exhilaration in the life to come be a reason why martyrs eagerly accepted their premature death? It's a question. I don't know the answer to that. But what I was really surprised at is when I dove into Gregory of Nyssa to find this opposite model explained in the fourth century. He writes, to miss anything that tends to pleasure is for the brutes a matter of pain. So he knew that if we don't feel pleasure, then we, we um, feel agony. Then he says, he, uh, man seems to me to bear a double likeness to opposite things, being molded in the divine element of his mind to the divine beauty, but bearing in the passionate impulses that arise in him, a likeness to the brute nature. He, that's, my interpretation is similar to him, except that I, um, I don't think we are innately savages and violent people by, by nature. I don't think that's what he meant either. Um, I, I think we're just still growing in, into perfection, so we're just not completed yet. Another interesting point that Gregory of Nyssa made is that, uh, for example, he gave the uh, example of the apple not being 100% evil, but rather having opposite qualities, which appears pleasant at first. It's beautiful uh, to the eyes and taste, but ultimately can uh, destroy us. I found that interesting because also heroin is pleasant at first, but then it mm, destroys you. He says that the actual very good is simple and devoid with the, without um, this devoid of this duplicity. 
I want to talk about love using this model a little bit because you meet someone you love and at first you feel this great excitement. It's very positive and you can't be without them. And as long as they are there and contacting you, then you feel very good. But the moment they are gone and then you fall into a bit of loneliness. Then after multiple stimulations, which means like in the case of a longer term marriage, um, you know, that euphoria is gone. <laughs> Um, I've been married 16 years, that euphoria is gone, so you're just normal, feel good. But then if my husband was to die, the opposite is grief. And it's much uh, bigger peak than that initial loneliness. So I'm playing with this model in, in these kinds of ways to try to understand um, this mechanism that I think we have. I will turn to Basil the Great for a little bit because... He was among the first to plant the seed of our co-interdependence on God and on each other. And he, what I found most interesting here is that he highlights our seeking and yearning for love. Some people say we're programmed to love. It's not true, really, in my opinion. I think we are programmed to seek beautiful things and seek love. When I gave birth to my child, I did not love him immediately. It took me like a year to learn to love him. I don't think many women are honest to say that but there are some that experience postpartum depression for example I didn't I just experienced that love is a learning process and I thought it was interesting that Basil the Great saw that we're we have the innate sense of seeking beautiful things and what is truly beautiful and loving we're not programmed to love immediately um Let's look at this a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so he highlights that the intense longing for God, uh, for love toward God is not, oh, he says not taught, but rather an, an innate feature of the human being. But I think it's because we're programmed to seek, and then through that we learn the, the love. Okay, I'm going to finish up. Uh, what I want to present now is uh, go back to my point of martyrs because this very much looks like craving and dependency. These are very strong statements. Woe is me that my sojourning is prolonged, so here on, on this earth. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. My soul has thirsted for the strong and living God. Lord, now, now let your servant depart. In um, the case of these examples, these saints who approach, who approach God's love demonstrate evidence for a strong craving or dependency that we do not uh, define as abnormal. We think this is completely normal. Yet these statements are very strong and indicative of a serious uh, dependency, a good dependency, I suppose. So why do I think all of this happens? I feel like I'm running out of time. So I will just say, I think the point of all of this, uh, why we go up and down, is what St. Maximus, the confessor, says, and that is to move us to a, a higher baseline, to move us towards closer to God. That's what I, and some people can get there easier, but most of us have to go through the down part. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and that's it. I'm not going to go into this, but I'm now... Um, looking at this model with trust and fear. And this is something Sister Vasa talks about. She often says that the opposite of faith is not doubt, but fear. So I'm testing that uh, notion with this model and the neuroscience that we know, because, you know, fear and anxiety are, are also stuff that we study. Okay, so with that, I'd like to just uh, do the summary. Ex what I showed you um, is I've ex with the model, I've expanded on what we know about addictions and integrated this information in, at least I tried in a theological framework to better understand the nature of our human nervous system and its capacity to be a driving force in love for God and love for neighbor. We have a capacity. It's not working perfect because we sometimes get addicted to heroin, but it's still there. Um, this opponent process theory, the model, the up and down that I showed you of motivation, does not assume that all hedonic disequilibrium states cause a corrective or oppositional reaction in the brain system, but rather it explores this phenomenon of habituation to the presence of something that is pleasurable and rewarding. 
and intensified grief by the absence of that which is pleasurable and the opposite habituation to the presence of something that's aversive and intensified uh, pleasure after the termination of that negative experience. This just shows us up and down. And uh, my final conclusion, experiences are instantiated in our body and brain to support behavior. They do, our neurons do not make us behave a certain way. There's still free will. Spiritual experience, therefore, must work through our physicality. I think they have to go through our brain, our neurons, our neurotransmitters. The brain system is equipped with this corrective mechanism to minimize hedonic states to help us teach to move toward resting at a new equilibrium in eternal God. And that is my final presentation. Thank you.